Hello um, and welcome back to my channel. I have to admit that there has been a bit of a gap in releasing this episode. It is just that I have been busy putting together a project for this episode, which involved learning about a new low code programming tool for hardware called Node-RED. Um, some of you may have heard of it or even used it, uh, but the tool was quite new to me. So I had to spend some time getting used to it. Originally, I was hoping to do a different kind of a video for this episode um, with a lot more uh, theory in it, uh, but I thought it is time we explored some of the practical side of things as well. But I did not want to do a simple LED light circuit for this video, which I'm sure you agree has become too common and has started feeling a bit repetitive. Um, instead, we are going to go a bit more deeper into some circuit building and then link that circuit that we built with some power apps. So with that in mind, what I have done is um, I have divided this episode into two parts. Um, in the first part, we will talk about hardware circuits and then we'll also design a simple circuit for on a breadboard. Um, you'll, you'll see what a breadboard is uh, 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 soon. We'll also look at how we will ultimately wire up that circuit that we have designed um, uh, that will be part one. In part two, we will then program the hardware circuit we designed using Node-RED and then see if we can integrate that Node-RED program with an app we'll, be, we'll put together in Power Platform. Fair warning though, um, this is going to be a heavy episode uh, with a lot of technical talk. So I would recommend going through this with a proper hardware kit. And now, if you have not done any hardware programming or physical program computing before, uh, I would recommend going through some good tutorials to do some basics and come back to this video after. I have linked some of them in the description for this video for you as well. So let's begin by trying to understand what an electrical circuit is. Now, there's going to be a bit of a theory, so, so bear with me. To understand that, we need to understand what electricity is. Now, there are many theories and explanations of electricity and its awesome powers and capabilities, but they all agree that the energy that the electricity produce, provides us and which we are able to use is fundamentally generated when electrons, which are negatively charged particles, move through a conductive field, uh, as in a field provided by conductive materials such as metals like iron or gold or silver. Typically, such a field is provided using wires and cables we use to connect various things together. We can induce the movement of electrons through those, those conductive materials by placing them in contact with positively charged particles, which is, which is called ions. Once the electrons start moving, we can place components such as lights or motors or any other electrical things uh, we can so that we can use the energy generated by the movement and make it do what we want. Such an arrangement is called a circuit. Now take a look at the diagram to your left. What you see is a simple circuit illustrated using line drawings. Like I explained before, the best way to induce electricity is bringing negatively charged particles in contact with positively charged ions, which is what a battery does. Now, if you have looked closely at batteries, you would have noticed two sides to them. This side is typically flush with negative charge, while the other side with positive charge. When you use this battery in a device like a, like a flashlight or, or something, what is happening is that the internal circuit of the flashlight induces electric flow, also called an electric current using a very simple circuit which connects both positive and negative sides using some wires uh, and they're putting a light in the middle. Pretty similar to the circuit that you see here. So this drawing is a representation of a battery on this side and a an, and an electric motor on this side. In circuits, components that generate electric power are called power sources, and components that use those ele that electric power are called load. The lines that connect the power sources to the load represent wires that carry the electric charge from the negative side of, of a power source to the positive side. 
the component the, the, this motor motors convert electric energy to movements using a series of magnets and coils of wires inside them now as we start looking at various types of components you'll start seeing a pattern most of these con components convert electric energy into some other sort of energy by arranging them within circuits we are able to do interesting things with them an electric circuit should electric circuit should always always contain at least one of these components uh, otherwise that circuit is called a short circuit and trust me you do not want a short circuit uh, going off since it could lead to fire hazards and are, and are pretty dangerous it is always good to ensure that whatever circuit you put together has no short circuits now i won't have time in this video to cover all aspects of electric circuits and uh, short circuits so i have added a few links in the description which provide more facts and information about electric circuits there are a few more things I need to cover before we move on to the more practical side. Each component that we add to the circuit consume electric energy to do what they are made to do. For example, an LED light, uh, such as uh, such as this one, when connected to a when connected to a power source, um, when connected to a power source, will consume electricity to produce light. The problem, though, is that an LED light could demand a lot more energy than a power source could provide, since all it will do uh, is, is that it will eat up a lot of power and burn brighter and brighter until it itself will be damaged because of it. The question then is, how do we force the LED to only consume what is needed uh, from a power source? To do that, first we need to figure out how to measure electric power. Now, electric power is measured using two different units. I have, of course, simplified it for the sake of this video. However, I have added a few links uh, to the description of this video that explains them in a lot more detail. Now, each of these two units has its place and need when designing a circuit. The first one, what you need to know about is volts, indicated by letter V. It is the power differential between the two ends of a, in, a, in a power source and it sort of provides us with an indication of how powerful a source is. In the case of batteries, as the power depletes, you will see that the power differential and the voltage also reduces. Now, when you consider other types of power sources like power adapters or, or, in an, or your house electric uh, power, power supply, they are pretty steady since they are not generated using a source that will deplete like a, like a battery. Now the second one is called amperes or amps and indicates the strength of electric current flowing through a circuit. It is typically indicated by the letter I. Each component you use typically comes with its own power ratings and limits, which sort of explains how much volts and current will that component consume. It will also provide you with data like with the upper and lower limits for voltage and amperes that the component can handle. You will find such details in what is called a component's data sheet. Um, they are usually downloadable from the internet for each of the, each of the components that you, you buy from market. When you build your circuits, you need to ensure that, that, that these limits are kept in mind and that, that you follow the data sheet diligently to avoid dangerous outcomes like short circuits, etc. Now, how do we ensure enforce these limits in your circuits? For example, how do you ensure that in a circuit which is powered by a 12 volt battery, how do you ensure that an LED with an upper you know, voltage limit of 5 volt can be used? For that, we use the, the most important component of all, resistors. Resistors sort of look like this. Uh, their main purpose is to restrict the amount of current flowing through a circuit. Now they have their own power rating and and uh, and resistance rating. Um, you will find that resistors are the most ubiquitous components used in circuits, and they are they are most useful as well. Um, in the example about using a five volt LED in a twelve volt circuit, adding a resistor to the negative side of the LED uh, of an LED. Um, uh, will ensure that the circuit is protected from a lot of current being drawn. That is because the resistors squeeze the amount of electric charge that is reaching the LED spins, thereby reducing the current draw. The LED may burn slightly dimmer, but ultimately the integrity of your circuit is protected. Now, how much and how many depends on the circuit, and we can use mathematical formulas to calculate the amount of resistance to add. 
probably too detailed for this video. So I have added some links to the description of this video, which uh, discusses resistors in detail. In the circuit that we looked at, you might have noticed that we didn't use resistors at all. Now, it turns out that you don't need resistors in a typical in typical motor circuits uh, since they have inbuilt resistance. However, you will see that they have a use of capacitors, which is a different type of a component, which, which we won't go, go into detail this time. Um, right, so that is enough of the theory. Um, let's design and build some circuits. So um, the project we are going to do for this episode is going to be a pedestrian crossing simulation system. We will add more features to this later, uh, but for this time, we'll focus on a very simple scenario. We have a, we have a very busy road, which uh, sees a lot of vehicular traffic all the time. We need to build a pedestrian crossing signal, which will have minimal impact on the vehicular traffic on the road but which is also safe for pedestrians to use to cross the road. The simulation consists of two LEDs representing the red and green traffic lights for the vehicular traffic. Green light is always on, which means that the traffic is constantly flowing until a pedestrian presses a switch. Once the switch is pressed, the lights should turn red for the vehicle to stop. And then after 30 seconds on, on red, giving pedestrians enough time to cross the road, the light should go back to green for the traffic to flow back, flow again. So once we have designed and built this circuit, it will look something similar to, to this. You can see that we are going to use two LEDs, uh, one green and one red, and a momentary switch uh, or a push button switch, which will trigger the pedestrian crossing system. The software we are going to write will pause a few seconds once someone presses the switch and then switch to red. After 30 seconds in the red light, the circuit will switch on the green and switch off the red, thereby completing the cycle. Now, you can see that it is all connected to a Raspberry Pi, uh, which, which will control the whole system. We'll cover the circuit design for this next. When I design circuits, there are a few things I keep in mind. That I'm consistently using colors to identify different types of connections that I'm using the right resistors where I need them, and also true for other types of components in the circuit, that I have not inadvertently introduced short circuits in my design, and that I'm accurate as I can be in my diagrams. The choice of the design tool for preparing the diagram is mostly personal. Now, I use a tool called KiCad, and I sometimes use Fritzing as well. For example, this design that you see here has been done in KiCad. It is quite important that people who are going to be using your designs clearly understand what connection should go where and what type of components are being used. Now, there are a few good practices to follow uh, that I list out so you all are aware. The first rule is the color scheme you use for writing. Now, it is a standard practice that any wires that connect components to the negative, you know, typically identified as ground or GND in some of the circuits like in the Pi, you know, the negative side of the power source are always blue, like you can see here. Similarly, for the positive side, it should always be red. Now, I use a mix of other colors to indicate signal and data lines. Like here, I have used brown and purple. The key point to remember is that when you're wiring up your design on a board like this, um, you should match what is in the design so you can validate and verify the circuit before switching it on and also to identify potential and possible faults. The second thing is consistent naming and labeling. You can see in this design that, that how I have marked LEDs as D1 and D2 and also detail the color of the LEDs like you can see here. Uh, you will also notice that the same with resistors as well. Now here you have, you know, uh, a resistor marked R1 and R2. Now, this is true for other types of components as well, so that people using your designs can attempt to match it in their wiring up. Now for resistors, the unit of measure is called ohm with that symbol, that symbol on it. This is also an important point 
Now you want to use the right units and notations when using components in your design so there is that there is no doubt in people using your design about what you meant to put in it. The final point that I would like to make is about large components like, like the pi here. You will see that the layout of the P pi in the design does not look like anything, anything like the physical layout of pi, pi that you can see here. Now, um, now this is typical in designs. I know when it comes to large components like the pi or a complicated IC, um, we will cover ICs in a future episode. The, the key is to remember to use the pin numbers rather than the physical layout. The pi has two different numbering systems, like right? So the first number, the first row one is the physical number, which you can see in red here. The second one is what is called the BCM number, which you can see in green here. Now, it doesn't matter which numbering system you used when you're doing a design or wiring up. Ensure that you use it consistently and accurately throughout your design. Now, typically I don't implement my designs until I have completed my design on a CAD program like this. However, I have made an exception for this video so I can show you how the design maps to what we actually implement. You know, in the next part, I will show you how I wired up the circuit with some pointers and some good practices as well. As uh, I will also be comparing the design, the the, the implementation with the, what is in our design file as well. Before I put together the circuit on a physical board, um, I like to prototype it virtually in Fridging. Fridging is quite visual in the way it presents your prototype and you can visualize how your final arrangement will look like as you prototype the circuit in it. Now, as you can see, I have almost completed the circuit prototype here. Um, Fridging provides us with a breadboard. Um, breadboards are brilliant for, for prototyping complex circuits. You know, what you see is what is called a half breadboard. There is a fuller version of this, which is twice the length of this one. Now, since our circuit doesn't have a lot of components, I thought a half a breadboard will uh, work great. Now, breadboards work something like this. The long lanes that you see here um, are on both sides of the board are what are called power strips or bus strips. We can use these strips to bring in negative and positive charges into the board. From there, we can use jumper wires to bring the power into the central part of the breadboard. Connections run horizontally and we can then straddle components between lanes and connect them together with jumper cables. Now, back to Fridzing. I can search for parts uh, and components and arrange them virtually on the virtual breadboard and visualize them. I can also use the right colors to ensure they match what is in our design files. Now, I am going to search and add missing switch part into the prototype and let's see how it works. So I've already searched for this. Uh, let's take a look at that. So I can look for that. And the part that I want is this. And I can basically drag and drop them here. Now you can see that it's it's highlighted the uh, the play the connection points here and which which ni fits nice snugly with the the connections that I have already made. Now that I have virtually planned how I'm going to lay out the circuit on my breadboard, I can now confidently start arranging it physically using real components. Now, before I do that, there are a couple of pointers I need to give you. First, and the most important one, is that you turn off your Pi while you're wiring up the circuit. Now, this is because simple mistakes like wrongly connected power supply or a short circuit might damage the sensitive pins on your Pi. So keep the Pi turned off uh, while you're wiring up the circuit. Now, the second thing uh, is the type of tools you use and why. Now, I like to use tools like these to ensure that when I lay out the components, they are snug and clean on the, on the board. This is a long nose ply. Uh, which you can use to bend the legs of components. Now, resistors like these tend to have large, uh, long legs, uh, which probably won't fit in quite nicely on breadboard. So what I do is I basically use this plier to bend the legs uh, in nice 90 degree angles. 
um, and clip them as well. So this, what you see here is a wire cutting plier and I can use that to clip the legs as, as once I have measured it and put it in the, in the, in the breadboard correctly. I can use this to clip the legs and then I can fit that into the breadboard. And the same with the LEDs as well. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to cut LED wires, but if you really want to, you can use, use the same sort of technique to do that. Now, these are not absolutely necessary when you're, when you're doing your experiments, but I would recommend it, especially if you are going to be using, L, you're going to be doing a lot of electronic uh, experiments in the future. Right, so that's all wired up and it seems to be working all right. That sort of finishes the video for today. Uh, in part two, what we'll do is we'll see how we are going. We can use the um, the software to control the uh, the circuit that we have built, right? So I hope you enjoyed this, uh, and I will see you next time. Cheers.